Cuba and Italy agreed to produce the Cuban anti-COVID-19 vaccine Soberana 02 in the European nation. Colombians rallied to mark the first anniversary of the social unrest caused by Ivan Duque's neoliberal reforms. Russia urged an important investigation of recent armed attacks in the autonomous region of Transnistria. Hi, this is From the South. I'm your news anchor, Dio Martin, from the Telstra Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. On Thursday, Cuba and Italy signed an agreement for the production of Cuban anti-COVID-19 vaccines in the European nation in the context of the Bio Havana 2022 Congress. The Memorandum of Understanding signed between the Finlay Vaccine Institute of Cuba, the Italian company ADN Pharma and Biotech, and the Italian Agency for Economic and Cultural Ex Exchange with Cuba, AICEC, establishes the production in its final phase of the vaccine against COVID-19, so at 2 the general director of the Finlay Vaccine Institute, Vicente Veres, informed that the intention is to evaluate in a second phase this vaccine as well as others of the institution that could be totally produced in Italian soil. This agreement is added to other cooperation mechanisms that both nations maintained during the COVID-19 pandemic. On Thursday, the agenda of the Prime Minister of Belize, John Antonio Briseño, advances in Cuba. The Premier of Belize will visit the Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, a leading company in Cuba that researches, produces, markets, and exports innovative products. In this context, Briseño will learn about the scientific results of the institution responsible for Abdallah, the first vaccine against COVID-19 developed in Latin America and the Caribbean. According to the agenda, Briseño will also visit the Fidel Castro Ruiz Center, whose objective is to disseminate, study, and research the thought and work of the historical leader of the Cuban Revolution. The National Association of Haitian Magistrates requires, requested the government to postpone the entry into force of the new criminal code decreed in 2020. The judges sent a letter to Prime Minister Ariel Henry in which they asked to postpone the implementation of the law for at least two years or to dismiss it until experts can analyze its legal consequences. This ordinance, approved by presidential decree in mid-2020, was the object of numerous criticisms for allegedly allowing amnesty to those accused of corruption, political and financial crimes, among other accusations. While magistrates call for the law's postponement, other voices point out that Henry does not have the prerogatives to dismiss a presidential decree. The International Women's Congress is closing today in Venezuela with the presentation of a unique political document and an agenda that covers all issues addressed. During the event, participants presented a declaration to remain united for peace and called for the dissolution of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, considering it a military bloc that responds to the war interests of imperialism. The text also reflected the voices of women who were victims of human rights violations. Delegations of the five continents present at the event also approved a resolution of solidarity with African women and with the peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. The President of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, welcomed the symbolic remains of General-in-Chief Manuel Piar to the National Pantheon. During the protocol ceremony, he showed an audiovisual material about the independence hero while recalling that he led the Battle of San Felix. This historical event is carried out on the occasion of the 248th anniversary of his birth, which took place in Willemstadt, Curazao, the son of the black woman Maria Sebal Gomez and the cannery Fernando Pierlotin. The Venezuelan president assured that this is an act of a sense of justice with the history of Venezuela. They don't know what we are made of. They don't know our spiritual and moral strength. They don't know the strength of the blood that runs through our veins. And with Piar, 
We declare it from the graveyard. General in Chief Piar, your people pay you homage. Your people pay you honors. And in the honors and tributes that we pay you, we swear at the same time to continue being loyal to the people of Venezuela and that the Bolivarian Revolution of the 21st century will continue its path of victory, splendor, prosperity, and progress. During the ceremony, President of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, also referred to the appointment by the National Assembly of the new directive of the Supreme Court of Justice, presided by Dr. Gladys Gutiérrez. Recently, the National Assembly, after an exemplary process, fulfilling all the mandates of the Articles of the Constitution and the Law of the Judiciary, proceeded to nominate and elect the 20 judges, principal, and 20 alternate members of the Supreme Court of Justice. Today, we have here present a woman of great value, great knowledge, great legal vocation, of great morals, who was appointed by the judiciary as the new president of the Supreme Court of Justice. I would like to congratulate Dr. Gladys Gutierrez. The former president of Brazil, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, welcomed the decision of the United Nations that concluded that there was partiality in the trial led by Sergio Moro, former judge in the Lavajado case. The United Nations gave 188 days for Brazil to say how it will make reparations. Ideally, they would be able to remove Bolsonaro and put me in charge of the country. But at the end of the mandate, I don't want to. That would be left to the people. The other thing is for them to ask for apologies. The press that called me a thief for so long, just an apology. They don't even need to blame themselves. It took Globo 30 years to apologize for not covering the direct campaign elections. I just wanted them to say, President Lula, we were cheated by Moro, by Dalagno. We just wanted to say sorry. We will never do that again. Do not lie without being sure of what you're saying. So I'm happy that decision of the UN was an extraordinary soul washing for me. Brazil was responsible for 40% of the planet's forest destruction in 2021, in which 1.5 million hectares of native forest resulted in its destroyed. According to a scientific article by the National Space Research Institute, part of the Amazon now acts as a net source of carbon as human activity reduced the forest's capacity to absorb it. An area equivalent to a soccer field of rainforest was destroyed every six seconds on the planet, and most of it occurred in Brazilian territory. According to studies by Global Forest Watch, the World Resources Institute, and the University of Maryland, the rainforest is losing its resilience and part of it could reach a critical breaking point. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. from the south. People in are mobilizing to commemorate one year since the social explosion caused by the implementation of the tax reform and other neoliberal policies by the government of Ivan Duque. Only a year ago, social organizations rejected the government's maneuvers to implement tax reforms, which included basic products of the family food basket, increasing the cost of gasoline and other services, 
The organizers of the event pointed out that the cities of Bogotá, Medellín, and Cali reported mobilizations from early hours. In this context, demonstrators raised their voices to demand changes from the government of Iván Duque, as well as the rejection of the systematic violence unleashed mainly in rural areas against farmers, indigenous, and Afro communities. Mechanisms were sought. Mechanisms have been exhausted with the national government. Local and departmental dialogue scenarios were sought. In a view of the fact that we have not received attention, we are not given an effective response to the situation we are expressing in the territories. As we use in the different municipalities and departments at the national level, we decided to go to the city of Bogota to declare a humanitarian emergency. Mobilizations are being prepared in 900 Iranian cities to commemorate the World Al-Quds Day on April 29th. Mobilizations will begin in the morning hours. On the occasion of World Al-Quds Day, marches or public meetings will be held in more than 90 countries in compliance with the biosafety protocols enforced by COVID-19. The Iranian government pledged to show massive support to the Palestinian people to condemn the aggressions by Israel. The Islamic Development Coordination Council informed that more than 5,000 local and foreign journalists Photographers and cameramen will broadcast the event worldwide. The call is also extended to the people of various freedom-loving religions. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan landed in Saudi Arabia on Thursday evening in a major reset of relations between two regional heavyweights following the slaying of a Saudi columnist in Istanbul. The visit marks the latest in Ankara's bridge-building efforts with its key regional rival. It is also Erdogan's first visit to the kingdom since 2017, the year before the murder in Turkey of journalist Jamal Khashoggi by Saudi agents. The two-day trip comes as Ankara and Riyadh have, in recent months, attempted to repair some diplomatic damage after a decade of tensions. Erdogan is expected to meet King Salman bin Abdulaziz and the country's de facto ruler, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Turkey and Saudi Arabia's economies complement each other, and the visit shows joint will to start a new period of cooperation, as the Turkish president put it. China urged the group of 20 to focus on its obligations and promote the recovery of the world economy and avoid polarization of international financial cooperation. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin called on the G20 to make positive contributions to the current geopolitical situation, which generates uncertainty and affects the ideals of growth in the nations of the world. The diplomat also indicated that the bloc and the international community need to remain united and cooperate in order to overcome the world's challenges and protect global stability. The World Health Organization and the United Nations Children's Fund warned about the increase in measles cases in the world. According to the two international institutions, measles cases increased by 79 percent between January and February 2022 compared to the first months of last year. WHO and UNICEF declared that the situation generated by the coronavirus in terms of inequalities in access to medicines and the detour of resources leaves many children unprotected against this disease and others that can be prevented by vaccination. The WHO General Director assured that the impact of the interruptions in immunization services caused by SARS-CoV-2 will be felt over the next few decades. The Democratic Republic of the Congo began vaccinating its citizens against Ebola after two deaths were recorded, according to the World Health Organization. The vaccination began in Bandaka, a town in the northwest of the country, where the new epidemic led the, to the two identified deaths. According to the organization, around 200 doses of RVSV Zebo vaccine were sent to Bandaka, and others will be delivered progressively in the coming days. The vaccination uses the ring strategy, where all people who have come into contact with a confirmed Ebola patient receive the vaccine, as well as frontline workers. So far, according to WHO, 233 contacts were identified and are under surveillance. In addition to vaccination, a 20-bed Ebola treatment center was set up in Mandaka. Now we bring you a story about a local undertaking in South Africa called Project Restore, which had helped poor families to clothe more than 100,000 children since 2015. 
programs are mandatory in public schools. To help families with its costs, Danolin Johannesen launched Project Restore 2015 to recycle fancy hotels' bed sheets into school shirts. We found the project of Restore SA through a linen supplier that um, we use now for Parker Cottage and uh, we are giving them the old linen now to make school shirts. The project called Restore SA transforms lining into school shirts. More than 100,000 children have been clothed since 2015. When all lining is collected, it ends up in a shop. A single bed sheet has enough material for five shirts in a vastly unequal country where school uniforms are compulsory. The project is the brainchild of Danoline Johannesen, who believes that no child should leave home in rags. We wanted to look at a way, how do we keep our children in school, um, how do we get them dressed for school, um, and how, how do we just, you know, boost their self-esteem. It is an irony that school uniforms, meant to erase differences in social class, cost too much for South Africa's poor. All the more so after the COVID-19 pandemic and unemployment passing 35%. So the shirts are a big help to mothers like Lemise Peters, who lives with her family in a township 200 kilometers west of Cape Town. Today I came here to collect a shirt for my daughter, and I'm very blessed. With fresh lining and loving tailoring, the shirts can hold up to the best, even those straight from the shop. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us. And welcome back. The Russian Foreign Ministry urged an impartial investigation into the recent armed attacks on public facilities and infrastructure in the autonomous region of Transnistria. The spokeswoman of the Russian diplomacy, Maria Zakharova, said that they are alarmed by the escalation of tension in the autonomous Moldovan region of Transnistria and stressed that such actions are interpreted as terrorist attacks aimed at destabilizing the regional situation. Zakharova condemned the attempts to drag Transnistria into what is happening in Ukraine and called for an impartial and thorough investigation of all the circumstances. We regard these actions as acts of terrorism aimed at destabilizing the situation in the region and expect a thorough and objective investigation of all the circumstances of what happened. We strongly condemn attempts to involve Transnistria in what is happening in Ukraine. Russia warned that Western arms shipments to Ukraine threaten Europe's security. According to the Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov, the entry of arms into Kyiv from other countries are actions that threaten the security of the continent and generate instability. In this regard, the foreign minister Sergei Lavrov assured that any arms shipment to Ukraine will become a legitimate military target for the Russian armed forces. In this line, the Russian Ministry of Defense detailed that the military attacks are not aimed at civilian facilities, but they seek to disable the war infrastructure of nationalists and Ukrainian soldiers. Several locations in Poland were left without gas supplies due to sanctions imposed by Warsaw and companies linked to Russia. Authorities in the municipality of Mieszysko acknowledged that residents lack heating, hot water, and gas for cooking food. The mayor of that town, Premislo Ren, said they are working to restore service as soon as possible. A similar scenario is unfolding in the Polish municipalities of Leba and Zagoro. The situation comes after Poland imposed sanctions against Russian companies Gazprom and Novatek, including the local subsidiary of Novatek Green Energy, which involves freezing assets. On Thursday, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, who went to Ukraine after a visit to Moscow, held a press conference with Volodymyr Zelensky. Following the meeting with the Ukrainian president in Kyiv, UN Secretary General said Ukraine is thousands of civilians need to life-saving assistance and vowed the organization will not give up in achieving peace. 
Guterres said the operation in Ukraine is one of the fastest scale-up operations the organization has ever undertaken. Prior to the press conference, Guterres visited several towns in Kyiv region, which were severely affected by the ongoing Russian special military operation. This war must end, and peace must be established in line with the Charter of the United Nations and international law. Many leaders have made many good efforts to stop the fighting, but these efforts so far have not succeeded. And I am here to say to you, Mr. President, and to the people of Ukraine, we will not give up. And the United States Congress passed another bill to loan United States military equipment to Ukraine and its allies. The U.S. House of Representatives passed the Ukrainian Democracy Defense Lend Lease Act on Thursday by a 417 to 10 vote after the Senate unanimously passed it earlier this month. The legislation will make defense equipment lending requirements for Ukraine easily accessible and will allow more United States weapons to reach the European region amid Russia's special military operation. The bill was sent to President Biden's office for approval. We've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at Tell Us Our English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Tell Us Our English, I am Dio Martin. Thank you for watching.